strengthened by the growing love between them. The poets now climb to the top of the stony chasm that ends the eighth circle, and they steel themselves to begin their approach to the ninth and final circle of treachery. What they are about to witness here is humankind's capacity to commit the ultimate sin of betrayal against family, against one's guests, and against God. Dante prays for the help of the Virgin, of Santa Lucia, and of Beatrice. For here, he tells us, all warmth of love for God has been extinguished. Now these last three pits are named Cana, after the biblical Cain, who murdered his brother, Anatoria, after the Trojan who betrayed his city, and Judeca, after Judas, who committed his lord into the hands of the enemy with an intimate kiss of peace. As our poets approach, Dante thinks he sees a city with many high towers in the distance, but Virgil tells him he is mistaken. These are the giants, Nimrod, builder of the Tower of Babel, that Virgil calls the blathering idiot, Antaeus the vain, and Ephelites, who conspired with the others to war against the gods. These three are the guardians of the final abyss. Images of the blind forces that remain within the soul, says Dorothy Sayers, and in society, when the bond of love is dissolved, when the good of the intellect is wholly withdrawn, and where nothing remains but blocks of primitive emotion. Forces as these, consciously tapped into, co-opted and manipulated through propaganda into the service of darkness by popular consent. Babbling Nimrod, spewing forth his vacuous slogans, vain Antaeus and warring Ephelites. These are the faceless giants, one might say, those who set the scene for Hitler's Germany and Stalin's Russia and countless other repressive and ruthless regimes through to the present day with its unchecked giant corporations, big tech companies and posturing oligarchs. By such means, we too are lowered into the abyss. Yet only by their leave may our poets proceed. But the giants have to be coaxed. Perilous indeed, yet Virgil takes the risk and he flatters Antaeus, assuring him that in return Dante will write about him when he gets home. And so they are lowered down to the deepest depths beneath. Dante then describes the frozen lake of Cocytus, the final face of sin, of lamentation. Here the souls are frozen in ice up to their necks. All semblance of humanity is lost. Dante is frozen to his core looking on. There is not space to tell of all he then saw, but one tale cannot be left out. Two souls savaged one another within the pit, so close together that the one head capped the other, and the uppermost set his teeth into the other as bread is chewed out of hunger. There where the back of the head joins the nape, 
They are Count Ugolino and Archbishop Ruggieri, and their chilling tale has gained much notoriety over the centuries. Enemies in life, and enemies they eternally remain. Ruggieri is said to have imprisoned Ugolino and his sons in the famous Muda Tower in Pisa and nailed the door shut. All then, slowly starved to death, Ugolino was the last to go, and to sustain his life, he's rumoured to have eaten his own dead children. It's hard to imagine a more gruesome scene, but still there is more, and in Canto 33, the poets come face to face with Lucifer himself, the great fallen angel, once the beautiful light-bearer of God's angelic host, now as hideous as he was once beautiful. His three grotesque faces, three mouths, each perpetually gnawing the heads of Brutus, Judas and Cassius. The image, most agree, is a parody of the Holy Trinity. And looking on, Dante addresses us directly. Ask it not, reader, for I write it not, because all language would be insufficient. I did not die, and I alive remained not. Think for thyself now, hast thou aught of wit, what I became, being of both deprived. Each of these souls committed what Dante saw as the ultimate betrayal. All were traitors to higher truths. All were beloved and trusted servants of their victims, which in Dante's scheme renders their acts utterly inexcusable no matter what their personal justifications may or may not have been. Their notions of the collective good, their belief, as was Lucifer's idea, that he might take matters into his own hands, that he somehow need not acknowledge the divine order and harmony of God's creation. If one who has glimpsed the mystery of love thereafter betrays it, writes Luke, holding it of less value than expediency, a doctrine, however noble, or anything whatever in heaven and earth, then he betrays the totality itself and accepts, like Judas, his thirty pieces of silver. This is the final treachery, and in this image, Luke continues, Dante has thrust before our eyes, with staggering force, the truth that Satan, evil itself, is fed and kept alive by the betrayal of conscious personal love between single individuals. We have seen all, says Virgil at this moment, and all at once it is time to leave. Thankfully, Virgil has been to hell before. His own epic, the Aeneid, Concern such a quest, and crucially, he knows the way out. Beatrice has chosen well. And it is a way no reader could have imagined or foreseen. For it turns out that the grotesque body of Lucifer himself will become the means of their escape. 
A way there is below, from Beelzebub cries Virgil, as far receding as the tomb extends, which not by sight is known, but by the sound of a small rivulet. He then seizes Dante and leaps onto Lucifer's back. Hold tight, he cries, panting like a man exhausted, since by these stairs we must depart from all this evil. And when the wings were wide open, he grasped Satan's shaggy sides, and then, from tuft to tuft, climbed between the matted hair and frozen crust. And when they had reached the waist, in truth, they had reached the centre of the earth, and they turned then, and climbed the other way. There is always a moment upon the inner journey, or in the therapeutic process, when the aspirant or client, as Mark Vernon explains in his new book, Dante's Divine Comedy, A Guide for the Spiritual Journey, when there is a turnaround like this, a moment of deep inner realisation, and one suddenly understands that the way in, the way down, is also the way out and the way up. And so it is for Dante. And very soon, Virgil clambers into an opening in the rock and sets him down to sit on its ledge. They are in the southern hemisphere and their path is before them. Taken literally, of course, all this appears oddly unlikely, this slithering down the body of evil and emerging on the other side of the world. But it really does reflect this spiritual reality, as Vernon suggests. When Jung delved down into his own unconscious, he too eventually went beyond darkness, beyond shadow, and came to the vast illuminated terrain of the soul. For it is not only darkness that dwells within the unconscious psyche, but light too, hidden treasure, and new ways to sunlit lands beyond, as Dante clearly shows. The guide and I then entered by that hidden path to return to the clear world, and not caring to rest, we climbed up, he first and I second, until through a round opening I saw beautiful things that the sky holds, and we issued out from there to see again the stars. E quindi uscimmo a rivedere le stelle. It is just before dawn on Easter morning. The soul is always seeking actualization, wrote the 12th century mystic and theologian Thomas Aquinas. It is innately possessed of the four virtues. And though it may stumble and fall, though it may seem interminably trapped, hell itself is but a state of mind, an enchantment, a spell if you like, and that spell can be broken, and the soul can eventually proceed. Then the dawn of Easter morning will appear on the horizon, and they will follow where Dante and Virgil go now, to the shores of the Purgatorio and to the light of heaven beyond. Mm -hmm.